Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. We are going to be starting our program very shortly. My name is Akif Mia, and I'm a professor of economics here at Princeton University. We are delighted to have two speakers with us who are going to be speaking on the topic of uh, religious extremism in Pakistan. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Pakistan, uh, the two individuals are very well known uh, as two progressive voices of sanity, I would say, in Pakistan that is sadly lacking these days. Um, we are going to first, the, the format is first, uh, uh, our first speaker will uh, give his opening remarks, followed by the second speaker, and then we are going to open up for a debate, a question answer, or a discussion rather. Uh, between the audience and the speaker, and I will try to moderate that interaction. So that's the plan for, for, for tonight. Um, let me begin by uh, introducing our first speaker. I am really pleased uh, that he is with us today, Reza Rumi, who is sitting on my right. Uh, he's a longtime journalist and public policy specialist from Pakistan. He's an editor with the Friday Times New uh, Weekly and a senior research fellow at the Jinnah Institute in Islamabad. In addition, Mr. Rumi has been a commentator and a current affairs talk show host in Pakistan and is affiliated with Express TV in uh, Pakistan. Previously, Mr. Rumi worked as an economist and governance specialist for the Asian Development Bank, the government of Pakistan, a number of Pakistani uh, NGOs, and the United Nations mission in Kosovo. Mr. Rumi is an academic advisor to the network of Asian, uh, Asia Pacific schools and Institute of Public Administration and Governance, a public policy advisor to Lead Pakistan, a non-profit focused on sustainable development, and he is an advisory board member of both the ASR Resource Center and the South Asian Institute of Women's Studies in Lahore. Mr. Rumi contributes regularly to Pakistani and regional newspapers on topics related to politics, policy, and governance, history, as well as South Asian arts and literature. Much of his writing is archived on his website, which is razarumi.com. He is also the author of Delhi by Heart, Impressions of a Pakistani Traveler, published by Harper Collins in 2013. Mr. Rumi holds a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in social planning, both from London School of Economics. He has also been trained in law and public administration at the Civil Services Academy in Lahore. In March of this year, for his outspoken progressive views against religious extremism, Mr. Rumi survived an assassination attempt that unfortunately killed his driver. Soon after, he left Pakistan and is nowadays undertaking research at the United States Institute of Peace. So with that introduction, I'm absolutely delighted to have Raza Rumi with us and he will be speaking with us uh, uh, for a few minutes, and then uh, I'll introduce our second speaker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Atif. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank. It's a matter of uh, great honor and uh, to be here and to be invited by Princeton and, uh, uh, of course, by Professor Atif Mia, who himself is a very distinguished young uh, sort of uh, rising star, both globally and, and Pakistani. As, as a Pakistani, I'm very proud of him. Um, I've been introduced um, uh, in much detail, so I need not go over what I've been up to. Uh, but I uh, would just like to make a very quick um, uh, addition to what you said, uh, Atif, and that is that uh, Pakistan, uh, unfortunately, has turned into a country where you uh, cannot uh, say certain things and you cannot raise voice against certain injustices and facets of bigotry uh, that uh, have uh, turned into a, a kind of a norm, a, a way of life. And whether it has to do with uh, questioning the hold of, of the orthodoxy uh, questioning the clerics and the clergy uh, who define much of what Pakistan is now and what Pakistan's identity is, uh, you are either likely to be sort of uh, silenced 
worst attacked and you know or killed and uh, this has supposed to do uh, with um, Pakistan's uh, entire history and its evolution it's a young country and as you all know it separated from the British India in 1947 and it was meant to be a place uh, where the Muslims as a minority in British India would be safeguarded, their economic, their political and their social rights would be safeguarded and, and in you know 60 years down the road or, or more it is now a, 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 a sort of a killer, an attacker of its own minorities and this, this whole evolution of a state uh, which uh, you know is, is both ironical as well as tragic uh, because when Pakistan's demand was being made the foremost uh, uh, purpose was to ensure that the Muslim minority uh, ha enjoyed full protection and liberties. Uh, and they were not just religious li li liberties, they were also uh, the idea of um, sharing power, of being empowered, of, of participating in national life. And that was what uh, uh, the whole Pakistan movement stood for. There are many views about the Pakistan movement. Uh, there were many contradictions in it as well, unfortunately. Uh, but once the country was made, its founder, uh, who did mention uh, Islam, who did mention Muslims as a, call, as a, as a basis for nationhood, uh, gave a very clear direction on August the 11th, 1947, in his maiden speech as uh, the Governor General of a new country. Uh, he made it very clear that, you know, yes, we have um, religious differences with India. We are a separate uh, uh, entity. But now that Pakistan is made, it would be a moderate and plural state. And that Hindus and Muslims, the two big uh, communities of uh, pre-1947 era, would cease to uh, be religious because they would be equal before the state. So the promise or the idea was a secular state, you know, he, he, he stopped short of using the term secular for its connotations because, you know, the Indian National Congress uh, uh, took upon uh, the secular identity for the, uh, for, for, for the Indian state. But it was quite clear that what kind of direction, because he deep down uh, and his advisors realized that if, if you were to uh, give a religious identity to a state, to institutions of governance, it would spell uh, trouble and, and disaster. And that, is what, uh, and that is precisely what has befallen Pakistan in, in 2014, uh, as we speak uh, now. Uh, the, the first uh, departure from that uh, ideal or the goal, policy goal that Mr. Chenna set came immediately after his death, within a year or so, when uh, the Constituent Assembly passed something, what is known as the Objectives Resolution. It was a statement of intent. It, it said, well, you know, we are Muslims and Pakistan is, is going to have an Islamic character, it's, it's going to be an Islamic state. Uh, fine, you know, there, there is a religious uh, sentiment and there is a lobby and there was even then uh, a, a whole group of, crew of people, parties, groups, interest groups, forces, uh, that wanted Pakistan to have an Islamic identity. Uh, but gradually over the decades, that piece of, uh, that statement of intent has turned into an operative part of the constitution. Now it is embedded in the, uh, in, in the constitution. For the sake of uh, time, I'm not going to go into too much into history, but by 73, Pakistan was an Islamic state. And, uh, uh, you know, currently its constitution bars a non-Muslim to become a president or a prime minister. The oaths of office for the highest officials in the country, which are appended to the constitution, uh, mention that sort of allegiance to the Islamic State, to, to quote-unquote Islam. And the problem with that is that it, that's all very good and, and uh, good intentions, but what is Islam? or what is Islamic and what is un-Islamic is something that has not been settled for the last 1400 years. Uh, and even today, uh, Islam, uh, there's no, uh, uh, the Muslims are not a monolith. Islam is not one uh, uh, sort of um, uh, 
this uh, easily definable set of rules or principles or belief systems. So, you know, it, uh, it varies, you know, there are many, many sects within Islam and there are many, many ways to worship uh, the same God and, and, and have practices and they differ. But uh, within Pakistan, that, that battle or that struggle has still not been resolved. And so we have uh, today uh, both a sectarian conflict as well as the unresolved question of the Islamic identity of the country. So, uh, 73 was that watershed and then in 74, um, uh, Mr. Mujib is going to elaborate more on that. Uh, uh, that was again a watershed where the parliament uh, took, uh, took it upon itself to define who is a Muslim and who is not a Muslim. So a whole um, sect within uh, the Muslims was uh, branded as uh, non-Muslims, excommunicated from, uh, you know, uh, what we call in Urdu Daira Islam or the, or the circle or the fold of Islam. And this is the parliament doing it. Parliament largely comprising secular uh, uh, pa political parties. Uh, the, the leading uh, or the ruling party was um, center of the left socialist party and uh, it had secular credentials, but that is the whole irony uh, uh, of Pakistan's uh, evolution uh, into what it is uh, today. And then uh, um, the 1980s saw another intense phase of um, institutional re-engineering and restructuring of the Pakistani state and the society along the lines of a particular kind of Islamization project that General Ziaul Haq, the then dictator, uh, um, and, and it is worthy to mention, was su supported by the US, uh, no less, and the West uh, for his role in uh, fighting the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, uh, unleashed a whole um, brand of Islam in Pakistan. So the laws were changed, you know, from women's rights uh, to what the criminal law would look like, uh, to uh, the law of evidence, um, uh, uh, even banking system. So it was all Islamicized according to the whim of a military ruler advised by the majority sect, which is the Sunnis, uh, and uh, which excluded the other uh, diverse uh, ranks of Muslims living in Pakistan. And uh, the net effect of that decade, and uh, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail about the kind of laws that were passed, but for example, the, uh, the law that the uh, Ahmadiyya community cannot call themselves as Muslims, or they cannot even use uh, uh, some of the Muslim references like the simple greeting like Salaam, or uh, writing Quranic verses on outside their homes, or on their graveyards or tombs. Uh, was also a crime. I mean, it is surreal. It is, uh, it is from, a, from a kind of a dark novel by Kafka or Marquez where, where a state chooses to, 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 uh, to make it punishable that you would use a Quranic verse uh, to, uh, to identify yourself or to, or, or to uh, you know, define who you are. And so consequently what we have to today, the hundreds of people languishing in jails, hundreds dying uh, because of this kind of bigotry and in, in, intolerance. And that decade also saw uh, the kind of growth of militant uh, organizations, Sunni militant uh, organizations, which also chose upon themselves to declare the other large group of Muslims within Pakistan, the Shiites, as uh, incidents. So you you had uh, wall chalkings, you had uh, massive production of religious literature uh, that justified why the Shias were not Muslims or half Muslims or not good enough Muslims or incidents or outright uh, vajibul qatl liable to be murdered. Uh, and that has seeped into that these these three decades have popularized these narratives, these these beliefs. And so you have these militant organizations which have a, uh, a, 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 the, the objective of actually eliminating uh, Shias and Ahmadiyya uh, community from Pakistan to purify the land. So that, you know, Pakistan, by the way, means land of the pure. So it is a bit ironical how it is being played out. 
uh, after its creation. And uh, so, uh, so just to give some data from the last uh, 10 years, I think nearly, uh, nearly 4,000 uh, people, uh, pers Pakistanis, have been purely targeted on religious hate crime. I mean, and, and, that, and that is not the, uh, much as the conspiracy theorists in Pakistan believe the Jews or the Christians or the Hindus coming in and shooting the Muslims, but it is actually Muslims shooting other Muslims, thinking they're not good, 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 uh, good Muslims, or they're not uh, full Muslims, or they're not devout enough Muslims. So you have this um, uh, kind of a public narrative where, where uh, a big number, millions, are insecure. Uh, and the strategy is very clear, is to actually target uh, those who speak up, those who are the intelligentsia, those who are influential. So for example, the Shia doctors, I think nearly 280 doctors have been killed in less than a decade. And these are targeted killings. They come out of the clinic, or somebody goes in and shoots into a clinic, or into a hospital, and these are people who are working for the benefit of the society. I mean, you know, um, in a similar way, in an Emily um, doctor, a U.S. citizen, uh, you know, um, uh, who, who went to volunteer a few months ago in Pakistan, was shot in broad daylight uh, in front of his family and young, young kids. And uh, such is the fear of the bigotry uh, and, and, and the militant networks that the government of Pakistan could not even bring itself to acknowledge that a doctor believing in Amadi uh, faith was actually shot down. And at a larger level, it's even more tragic because Pakistan's first Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Abdul Salam, uh, uh, who, I mean, who was a world-renowned physicist, uh, was disowned by, by Pakistani state and most of the Pakistanis because he belonged to uh, the um, Ahmadiyya community. And uh, so, in other words, he was the wrong kind of a Muslim or the wrong kind of a Pakistani. So, resultantly, children in Pakistan who study in schools and colleges don't know who Dr. Salam was. I mean, some know because there's a, you know, there's, there's agitation, there's a parallel narrative, there's, there's advocacy. But most of them don't know, and uh, the, you know uh, that can. Uh, I mean, that's a that's a larger symbolic thing because you I mean that's the first physicist from the Muslim world itself who was given that recognition, and uh, you know uh, Pakistan and, and many of the Muslims have disowned him. So what else could uh, could uh, define it better? But you know this. Uh, so so this 1980s decade actually laid down the for the the militant or the or the popular infrastructure, which kind of uh, created the organizations uh, which uh, chose them uh, chose to kill other Pakistanis, but also uh, created an intellectual and educational justification of this quote unquote purification. So from 1980 onwards, Pakistani textbooks were massively rewritten, uh, where uh, the, the only uh, uh, kind of Islam that was uh, uh, the Pakistani Islam was a Sunni Islam, where a lot of fabrications, a lot of myths were perpetuated against non-Muslims, primarily against the Hindus, because we, uh, we did separate from the larger uh, neighbor India, and then we entered into a per perennial uh, enmity within, uh, with India, and uh, Pakistan's uh, drift as a national security state, that is, that's a separate story, but it all so, sort of came hand in hand. And so children who grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I myself grew up in that era, uh, in, in schools, I mean, we turned xenophobic. So we thought that, you know, non-Muslims were bad, Islam was the best religion, it was only the Muslims could go to heaven, I mean, which, and, and, and these ideas are even violative of what the Quran says, I mean, the, the Quran says that anyone who believes in, a, uh, and, and, and believes in God or, and is good and does the righteous things will go into heaven. I mean, there are so many clear verses. But we were made to believe that, you know, only Muslims will enter heaven. And that to the right kind of Muslims, mind you. And so, um, and then, you know, all sorts of myths about what the Jews were plotting against the Muslims across the globe, what the Hindus were plotting against uh, the Muslims. I mean, they were drummed into, you know, these three generations of Pakistanis have grown up 
imbibing these lessons of hatred. So today, when an Ahmadi uh, is killed, or a Shia community is targeted, or a Christian church is bombed, often there is not the adequate response uh, because there is a partial uh, kind of justification uh, um, coming through the popular discourses, through the educational system, through the media narratives, uh, through the kind of popular literature. Pakistan's best-selling Urdu novelist at the moment, uh, you know, whose, whose works run into millions, is, is someone who, um, who also, you know, her first bestseller novel played on the theme where the, uh, the Emily protagonist of the novel had to convert to redeem him or her, uh, herself. So, uh, you know, uh, so that's the kind of popular literature that Pakistanis are reading. So that's just to give you a, a small example. And uh, this, uh, the whole, I mean, and, and Pakistan's other tragedy is also the fact that, you know, we have been embroiled into, you know, in the last 30 years, we've had to, uh, to deal with, uh, with, with two decade-long wars in the neighborhood. Now, that has, that has unleashed another dynamic. The first war necessitated uh, raising, uh, you know, violent jihadi networks to go and fight in Afghanistan to uh, resist the evil Soviet empire, and then they were pushed out, but you know, those jihadis did not go back anywhere. They came back to Pakistan, they became part of the society, so they had to be kept busy. So then they went to India to, to do uh, jihad over there to liberate Kashmir. Then they came back, when, when, and so, so they're embedded in the society as well. And then of late, since 9-11, uh, uh, when the second uh, Afghan uh, war started in 2001, Pakistan was, was again uh, central to that war theatre, and that has its impact because there's migration of population, there's resistance, and you know, uh, which stories that you all read in the international media, and, and I need not repeat. So it has had its impact as well. You know, there is foreign policy, there is strategic location of Pakistan, the geopolitics playing and feeding into what's happening domestically. The, the, the selection of a particular identity with jihad emerging as a foreign policy tool uh, for the last 30 years. So they, they, they have met somewhere and they've turned the society far way too violent. And in the last decade, we, we, we've seen these, these, these attacks on Shias grow. So, uh, you know, another community of Zaras uh, who are also founded Afghanistan, I mean, they, they have been uh, targeted time and again where hundreds of them uh, have either died at one go, in one go or have been uh, bombed, uh, their, their market places, their, their, their places of worship have been, uh, you know, raised down. Uh, and at the same time that these groups, were, because they become so powerful, they can cow down people uh, into uh, submission and, and, or, or, or into a climate of fear, then they start targeting other communities as well. So the Christians have also been uh, facing these attacks. There, were, there have been four major communal attacks uh, in the Punjab province where uh, at least 100 homes, the, the last one in Joseph Colony, Lahore, uh, the second largest city, uh, 100 uh, Christian homes were burnt. And there were these young men who were celebrating that. If you see the images, just Google that. And so you will see that a local makeshift church was also burned and they were burning the cross. And they were making these victory signs. What, is, what does that imply? It, it implies that there is an indoctrinated mind that thinks that doing that to non-Muslims is perhaps an act of worship or a, or, a, or, a, or a good deed, and so it needs to be celebrated. And that is the mindset that, that Pakistan has to reverse for its future uh, you know, uh, potential and prospects, because that is going to just uh, divide and uh, uh, induce further uh, chaos into the society. Um, so what is the way out? I mean, you know, I, uh, there are only two minutes left. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the most critical um, uh, aspect, as I mentioned, is the education system of Pakistan. And much has been written about it, much has been said. I mean, you know, Pakistan, um, unfortunately, also has a unique distinction of having the second largest school-going population out of school. So 25 million school-going kids are out of school. And those who are in school, get a kind of education. That's the kind of catch-22 you have. 
So there's a whole revamping and reimagination, reimagining of the education system that is that 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 has to be done. But more importantly, it is the state of Pakistan, its law enforcement institutions, its institutions of justice that have to uh, uh, you know shed this partisan or a sectarian or a re religious identity and act as a neutral arbiter of citizen and public interest. And that is, that is what is lacking. So that is the, uh, perhaps one of the other reasons, you know, uh, uh, Pakistan comes into uh, news for the wrong reasons many times, uh, that the rise in the cases of those accused for blasphemy uh, has also seen a huge increase in the last decade or so. I mean, the hundreds, I mean, there are at least 600 uh, who've been charged, 400, I think, in the, are, are, are in various pre 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 presence, and the judges are afraid to adjudicate uh, on them. The police is afraid to investigate impartially because the other dimension has entered, and that's a mob justice. So now, a, if a person who is accused of blasphemy or being, you know, anti-Muslim or anti-this or anti-that, can actually be a target of immediate, uh, you know, attack and, and justice. And the most glaring example uh, was Governor Tasir, uh, who was shot dead by his own police guard, highly trained. It was, it's known as the elite police uh, cadre, and uh, he shot himself. Why? Because he was actually advocating for the. Uh, rights of, uh, of, of a poor Christian woman, uh, you know, accused of blasphemy, and often this is to settle personal scores. And so he was raising voice, he was saying, let's amend the law, let's talk about the law, and let's review the law, and the guard just shot him. And after three months, <coughs> another Christian minister, you know, who was a, 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 a new vote person, uh, Shabazz Bhatti, was gunned down in April because he was heading a, a parliamentary commission looking into the possibility of reviewing the blasphemy law. There, was, there were no recommendations, there was no desire to repeal it. They, it was just, an, uh, just to explore the idea of, of, of making that law more humane or, or uh, less open to abuse. And he was gunned down. And, and there's a string of incidents. Lawyers, uh, most recently a lawyer in May, taking up a case of a 27-year-old uh, uh, accused of blasphemy, who was also a Fulbright scholar in, in the US two years ago, uh, was also gunned down in the office. And so now it's also becoming that difficult because the state has, is, 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 is both afraid and losing its wit to get uh, law enforced. And I think that, other than the education and its link to the state wit as well, is that Pakistani state has to uh, take stock of of its current um, uh, ability to enforce the laws, to ab the ability to enforce fundamental rights and and, and, and freedoms, and there is now rethinking that the army has launched a major operation against the Pakistan Taliban, and, and there has been a less uh, incidence of uh, terror um, uh, suicide bombings since the last two months. But you know that has to be sustained. It has to come up, come back with the reintegration of these thousands of jihadis who are around in the country, uh, something has to be done. They have to be given other skills, they have to be given other jobs uh, than just the promise of 72 virgins in heaven. So, you know, otherwise they would keep on blowing themselves or blowing others up or, 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 or killing enemies or she has to gain, um, you know, a, 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 a blissful life uh, in, in, in the paradise. So I think um, I'll just end there and then we can go into the Q&A if, if there's specific clarifications required. But just to conclude, I mean, you know, Atif mentioned uh, the attack on me and I, I, I think it's all um, part of that. I'm neither a Shia, I'm neither an Ahmadi, uh, but the thing is that I speak for their uh, basic rights to exist as citizens of Pakistan. So I was doing that in the broadcast media. And uh, which has a huge reach, and, and so some uh, organizations, uh, organizations thought that I was an and I was from the Ahmadi community. Some thought I was a Shia. Some thought I had converted to Christianity or an agent of the Zionists or the imperialists or the U.S. So there were all these ideas, and they all culminated in this assassination attempt, which I did not. I mean, I, my name was on various hit lists, but this is the extent of 
intolerance that, you know, without me, I mean, I'm neither a lawmaker, I'm, no, I'm neither a legislator, I'm neither a police, but I used to be a civil servant, I quit many years ago, I'm neither an intelligence operative, I'm neither somebody who could do anything, I was just trying to speak up. And I'm glad that I'm, uh, you know, I have this opportunity here to continue doing that. Thank you, Amit. Thank you very much, Raza. And as uh, Raza also mentioned, uh, there will be uh, a chance for everyone to ask any questions that you may have. Um, I'll move to our next speaker, uh, who's uh, sitting uh, at the further right corner. Uh, Mr. Mujibur Rahman, he is a senior advocate of the Pakistan Supreme Court and a founding partner in Rahman and Rahman Law Associates in Pakistan. In more than a half century of legal practice, Mr. Rahman has established himself as one of Pakistan's most renowned advocates, personally arguing scores of cases before the Pakistan Supreme Court, including the ignominious Zahiruddin versus State of Pakistan, which legitimized persecution of MD Muslims in Pakistan by affirming the power of the state to legally define both the form and content of religion. Mr. Rahman's courageous advocacy in the Pakistani uh, courts has been uh, appreciated by many, but in addition to that, he has also important publications to his credit. He has authored numerous books, including Error at the Apex, an incisive analysis of the Zahiruddin decision, and the newly published 1974 in camera proceedings of the Special Committee and Objective Study, which examines the legal and constitutional aspects of the decision by Pakistan's National Assembly precisely 40 years ago to declare remedies as non-Muslims under Pakistan's constitution. We are delighted, and I should add that Mr. Mujibur Rahman is on a tour of um, different colleges. He just went to Harvard and after Princeton he's giving a talk at Columbia and then he moves to the West Coast to Stanford and other places. So we are delighted that he could include us in his itinerary and uh, I would uh, request him to speak to us, and we will follow that question and answer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to be here in Princeton. I've never been here before. I hear the name of this university in my country. Many good scholars on economics and accounts come from this university, but my interest in the university has been uh, attracted by different things. University, this Princeton does not have a law school, and I'm a lawyer, and yet I'm speaking here. There are three things that attracted my attention while I was coming here to speak to the audience in this auditorium. Number one, the, way back in 1746, it was some Baptist father who started the University College. I, I, and I mentioned Baptist College because a religious group founded this college. And at that time, the Christian fathers, the Baptist fathers, were ahead of their time. And they specifically provided that students from any religion or any denomination whatsoever could be admitted in this college. It was not confined to only Christian students. So they were ahead of their time, number one. Number two, the second most important thing is this is, this, this, this Princeton University has its motto as Princeton in service of nation. That was the first motto. But after about 100 years, I think it was, uh, 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 President Monroe, who extended the motto to say, Princeton in nation service in, and in service of all nations. And all nations include a mad nation from which I come. <laughs> that, that is the third thing. And then another thing which has attracted my notice is that the great jurist that we have ever seen in the last 200 years, one of the founding fathers of the American Constitution, James Madison, was one of the alumni of this Princeton Institute. So that is my interest. 
which has provoked my interest, and I am very pleased to be here talking to you. Now, the, this liberal and inclusive attitude of Princeton, liberal because all denominations are available, inclusive for that reason, and also because it evolved its motto from being in service of the nation to service of all nations. This, to my mind, symbolizes the ethos of the Princeton University, and that is something that I greatly appreciate. The subject given to me for this evening, I have not given a free hand. A subject has been given to me, and I think advisedly so, because if I were given a free hand, I have so much to tell you and so much to talk, I could go on indefinitely, and that would perhaps not be the proper thing to do. Mr. Ru Mr. Raza Rumi, with his varied, varied experience, has talked to you and has given you a telling story of the madness that Pakistan is going through. But, and he has taken you that picture of Pakistan. I am not going to repeat that. I come from that community, I belong to that community, which has been targeted so badly and which has been persecuted through a legal institutionalized process. I am not going to talk about that persecution at great length because Raza Rumi has done a wonderful job. I could not perhaps improve on that. But I will talk to you, I am a student of law, and therefore I will talk of law and jurisprudence. And please don't be scared, I will not be talking strictly in the language, in the jargon of the jurist and the lawyer. I will try to talk of law in ordinary language of the ordinary citizen and the enlightened citizen because law is everybody's subject. Economics may be subject of Rumi or Mia, but law is everybody's subject, because every citizen is affected by law. Every citizen has to understand the law. So I'm talking of law and jurisprudence on a vital scale. The subject given to me is, as Raza Rumi mentioned, that I have been declared a not Muslim by the Constitution. So that subject is, the subject given is, you are not a Muslim. I'm, I'm hearing this in uni Princeton University. You call me, I am not a Muslim. And the, the, the other part is, religious liberty at peril in Pakistan. That is the subject given to me. And my response is, yes, my constitution says I am a non-Muslim. And constitution is the supreme law of the country. I, the five pillars of Islam constitute the creed, my creed, and believe them. I put true faith and sincere faith in the Muslim credo, Kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And I believe that Prophet Muhammad was his messenger and Khatim al Nabiyyin, whatever that means. But that is a part of Muslim faith. I believe in letter and spirit, the prescribed prayers, the fast. I turn to Kaaba in Mecca for my prayers, and I forbid myself all those things which Quran has prohibited, and I permit myself all, all those things which Quran has permitted. I add not an iota to the Sharia of Islam, and subtract nothing from the Sharia of Islam, and yet the Constitution says, I am not a Muslim, and the Constitution, after all, is the supreme law. So, I am a non-Muslim. I believe that Allah is one and unique, with no partner. I believe He is self-subsisting and sustaining all, slumbers, ceases and not, nor sleep. He, to Him belongs whatsoever is in the heaven and the earth, yet the Constitution says, I am not a Muslim. And Constitution, indeed, is the supreme law of my land. But faith is a matter of conscience, and conscience cannot be coerced. Therefore, I say, I refuse to pollute my conscience on the bidding of legislature. Conscience cannot be coerced. Faith cannot be infused or taken away from the minds of men. The state and religion, and I say it on good authority, 
I say it as a Muslim on good authority from Quran and the practices of the Holy Prophet that Islam and state are two distinct jurisdictions. The state has nothing to do with religion. The state cannot require the citizen to sacrifice his belief and conscience in order to conform to what the legislature says. But above all, I am here in Princeton and I am not forgetting that. Let me tell you that James Madison said, in the matters of religion, no man's right is abridged by the institution of civil society and that religion is wholly exempt from its cognizance. Religion is wholly exempt from its cognizance. Therefore, and again, Ahmadis have been declared not Muslim. Who does not see that the same authority which declares a sect to be not Muslim can with the same can declare somebody to be out of Islam, can, can with the same ease and uh, declare another sect of Muslims to be out of the pale of Islam. So I will not go into details of that. I am going to tell you the legal and constitutional basis. Uh, on this basis I say that the constitutional amendment which declares them is not Muslim is a nullity in the eyes of law. It is a usurpation of the constituent authority. The state did not have that authority. The, 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 the jurists in India, in Pakistan, in the United States, everywhere will tell you that the state has no matter to meddle with the affairs of the religion or the belief of a person. Because that is simply is impossible. And then, but despite that it has been done. That constitutional amendment, a nullity in the eyes of law, an encroachment of my rights, a denial of my fundamental rights, and yet it is a part of the Constitution, and I have my by it. I cannot, I am a lawyer, I cannot throw away the Constitution. I have to follow the Constitution, I can try to uh, interpret the Constitution, I can try my best to have the Constitution amended, but the Constitution stays. Now how does this madness come into, after that, the, the initial madness is, the state interferes into religion. Without taking you into the technicalities of law, the constitutional amendment said so and so people are not Muslims for the purposes of law and constitution. Very good. I took it at its time. The, my, my law does not take me to be a Muslim. I am quite satisfied if my Lord in heaven takes me to be a Muslim. If I can lead my life like a Muslim, I, if I can pray like a Muslim, if my practices are that of Islam, I do not care what the constitution says I am. But I was not, I was not alone. I was not left alone. The clergy in Pakistan would not leave me alone. The constitution declares me not Muslim, but does not in so many words say that I cannot practice Islam. Therefore, I continue practicing my faith. So what happens now? The clerics run to the courts. There is a spate of litigation. 35 cases in the province of Punjab were filed against the Ahmadiyya community saying, praying that the Ahmadiyya community should be stopped from praying like a Muslim, behaving like a Muslim, calling their call, of prayer, call for prayers like a Muslim, and praying that their mosques be demolished and raised to the ground, calling that their mosques should, should, not, should not face Kaaba, calling that I should not invoke blessings on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, calling that I should not stand and uh, prostrate before God. All those prayers in civil suits, between the courts. So constitution declares me not Muslim, leaves me alone to practice my faith as I am, but the madness says no, they have been declared non Muslim. How can they behave like a Muslim? How can they pray like a Muslim? So the case is in the court. Thirty five cases were brought together in the Lahore High Court, and I am talking of nineteen seventy eight, after the constitutional amendment. So the case is known as, if somebody is interested for the lawyer's interest, let's say, the case is known as Abdul Rahman Mubashar. Abdul Rahman Mubashar's case, all these cases, the case was argued for 14 days at a stretch. I had to argue the religious side of the case. The, on, the, on the basis of fundamental rights, the, there was a compelling argument which could not be controverted. So an argument was raised on behalf of the clerics. Yes, Pakistan constitution is constitution. Fundamental right is all right. 
But in our country, Islam is also a law, and therefore they have to follow the Islamic law. And Islamic law, according to those clerics, said that our mosque should be should be raised and turned into an unquote unquote unquote, and they should be turned into a filth depot. That is what the prayer was. That is what the argument was. So I controverted that argument, and ultimately, two judges of the High Court they held that Ahmadis, despite being declared as non-Muslim, are entitled to adopt the Muslim practices because it is as much a there of their faith, as much a part of their faith. So the result was, in nutshell, I say the result was the Abdul Rahman Ubaidullah case. The religious practices of Ahmadis. But not, not left in any doubt. If there are any doubt, Mullahs clear that doubt. What are my religious practices? So Abdul Rahman Ubaidullah says my practices were recognized. My practices were recognized. They were protected, and they were given sanction by the High Court. So now I was free. I was free even. My conscience was free. I I refused to pollute my conscience. But now the court says. Leaving aside the constitutional amendment, Ahmadis can practice as Muslims, though they are not Muslim, because those practices are as much a part of my faith. The matter should end there. The argument was compelling; could not be controverted. The clerics did not take the case to appeal in Supreme Court. They they had a better advice. They said, "Don't take it to Supreme Court. The judges will not agree to your prayer." So they did not. So that judgment became final. What happens? I am telling you how the madness came into it. Then the mul clerics keep quiet for a while till such time that they get an ally in the shape of a martial law dictator. And General Zayaul Haq in 1984, Raza Rumi has mentioned that. General Zayaul Haq in 1984, he passes an ordinance. I will read that ordinance to you to to make it clear to you what is being done to me in my country. So he passed an ordinance. Promulgated that martial law ordinance. Why did he need that? Why did the mullah need that? They are custodians of Islam. They can define who is a Muslim. They can do whatever they want. Why did they need the help of a martial law minister? Because the courts, the sanity still prevailed in the courts. Courts would not allow that. So martial law minister did what some of the legislators do all over the world. He gave a riding effect to his ordinance. And he says, now this is the opening part of that ordinance, that statute. Notwithstanding anything contained in any judgment of the court or any other law for the time being in force, this ordinance shall have effect. Notwithstanding judgment of a court. So the purpose was to get off, get rid of the judgment of the high court. So the sanity once again turned out of the door. So what that, what did that ordinance say? I will read that ordinance for your benefit, because the first part is of the, mostly will not be understood by my audience here. It says any person of Qadiani or Lahori group. Have you heard of any law which picks out a community to penalize? The law is anybody who commits larceny shall be punished. Anybody who commits commits murder shall be punished. Anybody who slanders will be punished. Anyone, not this particular group or individual. So the community has been picked up, singled out for the penal law, so that my day-to-day -day practices are criminalized. <coughs> They have been criminalized. My my day-to-day -day practices are impossible unless I go to the. I get punished for them. So the, the this is the first part where certain epithets, which the audience here, many of the audience here may not understand. So I'm leaving that out. Those epithets were prohibited to me. Those epithets were nothing but invoking blessing on my elders, on my parents, or different ways of expressing certain things. So those epithets were denied to me. Then the second part said, any person of Kadiani or Lahori group, by whatever name they they call, by the do call themselves by Ahmadi or by any other name, who now listen to this. Who, by words either spoken or written or visible representation, refers to mode or form to call of prayer, his faith as an azan, 
and recites azan as used by Muslim shall be punished with three years imprisonment and fine. Can we beat that? Any person of Qadi, any group, if a Christian calls the same azan, he is not punished. If a Hindu calls that azan, he is not punished. If Amadi calls that azan, it is punishable for him three years imprisonment. <coughs> then another, still, 298C. Any person of Qadiani or Lahori group who directly or indirectly poses himself as a Muslim or calls or refers to his faith as Islam, I am referring my faith as Islam here. If I do it publicly in Pakistan, I can go to jail for three years. Who refers to his faith as Islam and above all, such a vague word which no law will entertain, being too broad and vague, poses himself a Muslim. How does a man pose to be a Muslim? Just because I'm, wear, I'm wearing a beard like a Muslim, I am posing as a Muslim? Just because I speak the truth which Quran says should be spoken, I am posing as a Muslim? So, uh, how do, so the, the effect is that anything that can I do, that, that I do, can be converted into a crime. So the, this was the statute which was passed. All right, now this statute has come. The court did not agree, the martial law. The next step. When this happened, now this is where my struggle also started. I have spent 53 years of my life fighting out these cases. What I did, I challenged that ordinance of martial law administrator. I could not do it initially in the Supreme Court because the martial law, under martial law, the constitution was held in abeyance for a while. The fundamental rights were held in the best for a while. So what did I do? I tried to beat them on his own ground. Ziaul Haq had introduced what he called as Sharia law. He had created a parallel jurisdiction of Sharia courts, the Islamic courts, that was intended not to enforce Islam in reality, but to curtail the jurisdiction of the courts, superior courts. So he created a Sharia jurisdiction. And in that jurisdiction, any citizen could challenge a law on the ground that it is not in conformity with Quran and Sunnah. I was happy, all right. I'll meet you on their own ground. So I challenged that ordinance in the Sharia court. And I said, I may be whatever I am. But under the Islamic law, under the dictates of Quran and Sunnah, you cannot prohibit me from doing anything which is permissible under the Quranic law. You cannot prohibit me from calling Azam. So there was a long argument. I argued for 14 days. And there were 14 clerics who appeared as the jurist counsels of the court. Long, long story. I don't want to go into that. But ultimately, what did the court do? My arguments were not controverted. I don't go into that detail. The court said, the ordinance, the whatever Bajibur Rahman says may be valid, but the ordinance is the result of the constitutional fear. I was asking him to give me judgment on Quran and Sunnah. The court takes me to constitutional jurisdiction. <coughs> they begging the question. But what happened in that case? That case in that case I had created a division in the court. The court was divided. The Chief Justice happened to agree on many points with me. That Chief Justice was removed by the Martial Administrator. The short, the short order was passed by five judges. And when the detailed order came, it was signed by four judges. No mention what happened to the fifth judge. Did he die? Did he retire? Was he swallowed by earth or was he lifted into heaven? What happened to the fifth judge? We are entitled, any, any sensible man would say, we are entitled to the opinion of the Chief Justice. Where is that opinion? But that opinion is not there. And World International Commission of Jurists, they expressed their surprise on this kind of a thing, that the opinion of the fifth judge is not there. So I at least created a division in the bench. And I say, though that judgment may be holding the field still, but it is a divided judgment. And many a times in America, you know, the minority opinion becomes a majority opinion after a while because the, because the matter is open to debate. 
But then what did the Chief Justice say? The, the, my country, my countrymen, everybody is entitled to know. But that is not there. So that case ended there. Mujibur Rahman, it may be permissible. I, I pointedly quoted every component of Azam. I recited Azam inside the court. I said, what is wrong with this component under Islamic law? And they said, nothing wrong with this. You can do the, you can proclaim the unity of Allah. You can proclaim the Prophet of Muhammad. You can proclaim that this Adhan. No, even though you are a non-Muslim, I cannot stop you from pro proclaiming the unity of Allah. What is Adhan? La ilaha illallah. God is one. Who can stop you? But the court said, but nevertheless, the constitution says you are a non-Muslim, so therefore the constitutional fear takes precedence. All right. So I, I, I did not stop there. I also challenged the ordinance in the, in the, Sharia, in the Supreme Court when the martial law was lifted and the uh, opinion, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, the ban on the fundamental rights was lifted. I challenged that on the constitutional jurisdiction. Zahiruddin and some other people were imprisoned to three years imprisonment, sentenced to three years imprisonment, because they were wearing a badge on their shoulders which on Kalama Tayyaba inscribed on it. They said, you are posing as a Muslim. He's not speaking. You are just putting it there. By visible representation, you are showing yourself to a Muslim. By visible representation. If I say, Allah is one. By visible representation, you are, you are posing as a Muslim. So on that, they were imprisoned for, for three years. I took the matter into Supreme Court. There were others also. There were eight appeals. Some of them are criminal. The others were civil. Eight appeals were held together. I argued the criminal side. And the chief and the leading judge, he granted my prayer and those people were acquitted. He granted my prayer. He said, Kalama Tayyaba displayed with honor and not defiled by an Ahmadi is no offense. And he said, you cannot peek into the deeper recesses of a person to determine that he is defining it. So the offense is not committed. But four judges, they decided against me. Again, a divided opinion. Those, those four judges, I have reason to believe that there was a lot of cleric pressure and all that, and the martial law administrator was still holding the field. So but, but whatever happened, I'm only giving you history of this madness. So the, the Supreme, and what did the Supreme Court say? How did they validate this madness? They said, <coughs> Constitution says you are not a Muslim. And the Muslimness is the prerogative and the monopoly of the Muslim. So just as the manufacturers of Coca-Cola cannot allow any other beverage company to use their name, how can you use the name of Islam? So, so religion was reduced to the level of a merchandise. I ask any one of you here, is religion a saleable commodity? Can conscious be put on sale? Is it, does it have a monetary interest? Which man of any religion can say that he is following a faith for monetary benefit? Coca-Cola is protecting the monetary interest and it is a registered trademark. Where was Islam registered? With whom? When? Under what law? But the Supreme Court applied that. Said, on the analogy of Coca-Cola and the Lever's brother who, public, who, who made the Lux soap and all those things, if, if their right can be protected, which is worth only a few pennies. My faith is very important. To protect my faith, I will apply that law. All right? That, that, that was one argument. It is for you to decide what is the worth of that argument. Then they said, Mujibur Rahman has been talking of fundamental rights and everything, but constitution may be there. But the constitution is overridden. The, the, there is an article 2a, the Islamic provisions override the rest of the constitution. So therefore, the constitutional relief cannot be given. Now mark that argument. Constitution overrides the uh, the Islamic law overrides the provision of the constitution. That is the argument in my case. But this argument, in a case shortly before my case, which is known as Hatim Khan case, 
in that the five judges of the Supreme Court said the constitutional provision do not, the Islamic provision do not override the other parts of the constitution. Long argument. I am not taking you to those legal niceties. In so many words decided that fundamental the Islamic law, Article 2A, does not override the other provisions of the constitution. In my case, they say it overrides. Shortly after my case, there is a case on the Marshall, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. His case came before the Supreme Court. He was dismissed from the Prime Minister's chair. And the Supreme Court, again with five judges, said the Islamic law does not override the constitutional provision. So I am the only exception. So all small, narrow exception for me in the, in the constitutional history. Does that ever happen? So our Supreme Court is in conflict in its own judgment. If I live long enough and I, I, if I see uh, enough opportunity and if the composition of the court is, is suitable to me, I am going to challenge that. The Supreme Court judgment can be, it needs to be revisited. Many jurists in, in America and England uh, and in Pakistan, they think it is a bad judgment. It needs to go. It is a pernicious judgment. So that judgment stands and that is causing the whole problem, as Radharuni said. My children, when they go to school, they are really cruel, they are segregated. And on that segregation and the pressure on the children and the students is twofold. By the students and that's so, and by teachers. I am reminded of a brilliant lady student, girl student, in Faisalabad, textile industry. Now what has textile to do with faith? Except that <laughs> it produces cloth to cover, cover yourself. But anyway, she was a student of a textile industry at a textile uh, college and her teacher came to know that she is an Ahmadi and started asking her to change her faith. Started pressurizing her, her, her grades would be affected. She ultimately had to leave the college and go away. In Faisalabad, 14 students were expelled from the college because they are Ahmadi and good grades, good marks, brilliant students. The government could not do a thing, but the government could not also justify it. So the Punjab government somehow accommodated them in the other colleges. In, in college dormitories and schools, the students refused to take food with the uh, Ahmadi students on the same table. In the, in, the, in, the, in the syllabus, now syllabus of higher classes, postgraduate classes perhaps, you could have difference of opinion, niceties of interpretation. There are 72 different interpretations of Islam. Perhaps there you could do something. But in the primary school, in the primary school syllabus, the hate literature was produced, as Arumi had said, was incorporated by the textbook board. Then in the marketplace, when an Ahmadi lady is gone, her headgear indicates that she is an Ahmadi. And the shopkeeper, having sold her the uh, merchandise, her dress look, lady, are you an Ahmadi? She says, yes. Sorry, I don't sell to you. Same happens in the industry. Same happens in the services, in the educational institution. So that kind of madness is continuing. And the problem is that that madness is sanctioned by law. Madness in every society, sometimes there are people uh, who are intolerant and there are people who do different things, but that madness is not sanctioned by law. In this case, uh, the, 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 the other part of your uh, topic that has been given to me, that religious freedom is a great paradox. I am here to tell you, religious freedom is not at peril alone. It has been destroyed. It has disappeared. The, the, the tolerance is scarce and the freedom is absent. Mm -hmm. And the irony is, just as uh, Jonathan Swift said, we have in our country, we have just enough religion to make hate one another, but not enough to love one another. So religion is used for hate for that, that purpose. And I would conclude by saying, that do you not think that it is a challenge to the free man, conscience of a free man, anywhere in the free world? And if it is a challenge to your conscience, 
Do you not need to raise your voice? In whatever form. That is my submission. I am open to questions. I, I just wanted to add one more thing, you know, about the persecution and uh, segregation and sort of apartheid type conditions that uh, Mr. Mujib uh, uh, cited. Uh, let me also uh, add the most dramatic one that I, being uh, Muslim, so which means I'm not an Ahmadi, have to sign a declaration each time I apply for my passport, for an identity card, it's like a driving license in the US that I, I hereby declare that all Ahmadis or Qadianis are non-Muslims and their leader is someone who is quote-unquote an impersonator and that the true Islam is, is the only Islam that I practice. So I've done it seven times, by the way. <laughs> Rumi, <laughs> you have done it against your conscience. A <laughs> bow, bow upon you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bujibur Rahman Saab and uh, Raza Rumi. I'll, what I'll try to do is I'll try to take a few questions together and then uh, hopefully the process can be more efficient that way. Uh, there's a lot of light in my face, but if you, if you could just uh, raise your hand, I'll, I'll try to take your questions. Yes. Uh, I, was, I was just taking while Rumi was talking about the last 30 years. Certainly, this has been a much more extreme form of what started in Pakistan. One would argue creating a country on the basis of religion was also a little bit of a flaw. But then you go into a year and a half of Pakistan roughly in March 1949, when the second ruler, Yaqub Ali Khan, passed a thing called the Objective Re Re Revolution, in which the first objective, and this is what constitutions are based upon, the first objective was that um, sovereignty belongs to God alone. They use the word Allah, the Arabic word. And that that sovereignty, God has delegated to the people of Pakistan and they have been entrusted to carry out Pakistan's rule under that trust. Now, and then in 56 it becomes the Islamic Republic. All, all the time when Jinnah, who was the first uh, I just received the case of Pakistan and asked that it would be a secular state. So don't you think all of this started then and that was the time when we should have been a little more wary about this? Thank you. As I said, I'll take a few questions and then we'll, we'll address them together. Any other? You can, you can take the mic as well so that everyone can The uh, Saudis have played in, in the financial battles of the government of Pakistan for the last 30 40 years since the Soviet invasion. Uh, with the uh, blessing of the United States and other Western powers who wanted to see the Soviet Union demolished. Uh, and that role has continued and is still in place and that's why you see the kind of bigotry that they practice in their own holy land exported and Pakistan became a crucible and still suffering. Thank you. Any other question? Jake. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I'm, I'm a little curious. So it was not that long ago, between 1870 and 1930, that we had uh, 3,000 people killed in the United States in kind of terrorism over a number of years that was directed at repressing uh, and minority, mainly for economic reasons. Right? And uh, we emerged from that period of violence into a long period of non-violent repression, mostly. Uh, and only 30 years after that that we kind of had the political will to emerge from uh, that deeply institutionalized exclusion of a population to something that's more solid. Right? And so I'm curious in the case of, of Pakistan, why, what's motivating the repression? Are there kind of economic gains to be had for certain groups from the repression? Are there political gains? Uh, what's driving it? And why are we kind of lacking the political will? Why are Pakistanis lacking the political will to kind of change that? Right? In the US, there were certain key actors who emerged to create.
great stance and awesome limited. We're not seeing that in Pakistan yet. Thank you. So we'll start with that question and I'll come back to the other two. Rajiv, sir, you want to start? Is that question directed to me or Rumi? Well, any of, any of you could answer without me. Do you have something to say? Um, sure, let's start what, with uh, Jake. So, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I think um, it's a very interesting uh, parallel that you've drawn. And, uh, but I think, uh, yes, there are definitely economic foundations of this whole hedge enterprise. And conflict, uh, you know, has turned into an industry in Pakistan also. For, as I said, two decades of war generate interest in continuing uh, the, the, the wars and, and other conflicts. And Mr. Bajibur Rahman was in a very idealistic manner saying that uh, religion is not merchandise. I would disagree very, very humbly. It is in Pakistan. Uh, you know, religious enterprise is the most... Uh, lucrative, you know, you don't have to study anything, you don't have to do anything, you, you can just be a mosque player and live a very good life and even pick up a gun to shoot another, another one, you'll also get a lot of funding, as somebody said, from Gulf states or whatever. So I think there is, there is an economic uh, argument. In fact, a lot of blasphemy cases against Christian communities, a lot of attacks on, community, on, on the Christian communities take place because the land, very precious land, uh, expensive land has to be vacated by scaring them away and, uh, you know, asking them to leave so, so that somebody can come and actually grab that land and sell it at a very high pri price. But I think it's deeper than that. I think it has to do with the ideological, um, uh, ideological position uh, that Pakistan has taken. You know, the emergence of Islamo-nationalism as Pakistan's identity. Pakistan's <coughs> nationalism is like, who, what is being a Pakistani? What is being a Pakistani nationalist? What is being a Pakistani patriot? Is being a Muslim? Is being a good Muslim? Is being the right Muslim? And this is why, you know, as uh, was mentioned by a friend here on the initial contradiction that Mr. Jinnah wanting, using religion to create a state and then saying that it will be a secular state. I mean, you know, it's an unresolved you know, question still. But I think an interesting anecdote here is that Mr. Jinnah belonged to the endangered community. I mean, he was uh, from the Shia, Ismaili faith. And uh, he, he had also converted to Asna Ashri because he, he only had one daughter. And according to that sect, uh, uh, the daughters can inherit all the property. In other sects, uh, uh, it's not the case. You know, other uncles and men come and take, take, take the share. Uh, but his public funeral was not done according to his sect. So there were two funerals for Mr. Jinnah in a very nice Pakistani way. One was a private Shia funeral attended by his friends uh, and his family and his sister, and the larger public funeral, which was a Sony funeral. So that contradiction and division is still there. I think what has happened is that it is it has to do uh, with the, as you said, some courageous leaders have to stand up, some political parties have to stand up, but sadly, uh, with each passing day, we see that all the, uh, all the political parties, all the leaders are actually uh, expanding that narrative, are further deepening the ideological rot in Pakistan. If I may add to that, some parallel from the American jurisdiction was drawn. There is a difference between uh, difference of opinion resulting in violence and difference of opinion in resulting in non-violent expression of difference. In America in 1930s, there were many cases against Jehovah Witnesses. And at one point of time, even the American Supreme Court decided that some of the rights were not available to Jehovah Witnesses. But the American society in America was so strong, the Civil Liberty Union raised such a, such a, such a huge cry that within a period of three years, that Jehovah Witnesses <coughs> case was overturned one of the judges of the earlier court sitting in the later, later court also. In my country, that civil society does not speak out mm -hmm. for various reasons. Now, the other question that he has talked about ideological reason on the idea, this is a very vast dispute, but I will just mention certain things. 
on the ideological dispute and the monetary interest and the Saudi influence. That, that, that is something somebody asked about the Saudi role also. I'll talk about that. But this is just about the ideological conflict. The ideological conflict in the Muslim world is the result of political Islam, not the Islam as such, but the political Islam. And nowadays, nowadays we, our scholars, or some scholars here in the West, have, have coined a new word. It's instead of calling it Islamic, they call it an Islamist. So that Islamist attitude is political Islam. What is behind that? As I see it, and it's a vast subject again, the distorted notions about Khilafah and distorted notions about Jihad have created the havoc in the Islamic history over all these years. After the initial period, the difference of Khilafah, Khilafah, Khilafah was a spiritual succession of the Prophet. But people tried to don that title, that holy title, the tyrant rulers called themselves Khalifa. There were Khalifa in, uh, in Baghdad, there was a Khalifa in Egypt, there was a Khalifa in Spain. And there was the monarch in India. But they all donned that title enough for their political purposes. To legitimize their tyrant rule, they adopted the role of uh, Khalifa and they said all Muslims need to be. But whereas Khilafat, in fact, the Holy Prophet himself had talked about his succession, how it is going to be, he had given a clear picture of how, how it is going to be and how it is going to be. So, uh, now the ISIS is the creation of that distorted notion of Khilafat. So people are stick, sticking to that concept that we can gain political power by using that title. That is not the right thing to do. And this whole philosophy goes back to a distorted, again, a distorted interpretation of Ibn Taymiyyah. I am aware of research work carried out, I think, in Harvard or Boston University somewhere, Ibn Taymiyyah and his times. That research has clearly established that these Taliban and the other people, they use Anwar al-Sadat was killed on the fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah because it is said that when Mongols attacked Baghdad, <coughs> the Baghdad the Khalifa at that time sent Ibn Taymiyyah to argue with them or negotiate with them. And that the Mongol warrior, whoever it was, he said, how can you fight with me? Go at my camp and see Azan being called. We are Muslims. Our elders converted to Islam. And Ibn Taymiyyah says, yes, I can hear Azan. You are Muslims, but you follow the Yasa code of your own. You don't follow the Islamic law, so therefore we made a jihad against you. That is how the fatwa goes. But that <coughs> fatwa has also been distorted. So on that ground, the Taliban version is that a Muslim ruler, wherever, I don't want to name any country, and this is going to happen, this is going to be repeated, what happened to Anwar Sadat, that a Muslim ruler who does not enforced Islamic law is an apostate and the punishment of apostasy is death and a Muslim ruler can be killed and Baru Sadat was killed with that ideological edict behind him. So that ideological edict is now being further more being polished up by the Taliban. They have, they, they call it Al-Vilaya al, al uh, 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 they, they, they call it the friendship, the apostasy and friendship. One who, is, who, who befriends non-Muslim countries is also an apostate. So that kind of ideology is working behind it. But there are many currents and undercurrents interacting. As about the Saudi influence, I can only narrate one incident. In 1974, when, 73, when this amendment against Ahmadis was being, was being considered, Precisely at that time, Bangladesh had broken away from Pakistan. And Bangladesh had, within a matter of weeks, evolved a constitution calling Bangladesh as a secular state. And the Saudi king, through his ambassador, asked Mujibur Rahman <coughs> to change the secular character. Of, and this is written by Dr. Kamal Hussain, who is a, still a living author. He was the first, uh, first foreign minister of Bangladesh, the founding father of the constitution. He drafted the constitution. He has recorded this. So Saudi uh, Arab uh, ambassador's king wanted the, uh, the diplomats to talk about this, but nothing was coming out. Then Sheikh Mujibur Rahman says, on a meeting, King Saud personally said, Mr. Mujibur Rahman, you are a Muslim country. We want to help you out in a big way. 
But this uh, secular kind of a country, how can that go? And he said, you are great. You are the custodian of the holy places. We are Muslim. Thousands of Muslims from Bangladesh go to Saudi Arabia. We respect you. Whatever help you want to give us, it is welcome. But if that help is, uh, if that assistance from you is linked with declaring the country as a an Islamic state, sorry, it is it is Bangladesh secular constitution framed by the constitution. I can't do that. Point blank. And that was the time when even Bangladesh was not recognized in the United, in the United Nations. So that man had that courage. But the great man, the great. Uh, 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 scholar and the uh, uh, student from Colombia and Harvard and what not, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, readily yielded. And his own finance minister is on record having said that Bhutto needed money. So, I mean, Saudi Arabia and all those ideological conflicts, they are making, uh, uh, creating many kinds of influences, but they, they are now coming out. Uh, they, this is no longer a secret. I have mentioned that in my book also. Thank you. Take one more and then we'll go back to the speakers. Um, two uh, questions. One is an observation, I guess, and the other is a question. Uh, somebody brought up the objective of characterization. I'm going to read uh, a line from a moment of all this pamphlet. One of his pamphlets about, uh, I can keep all the five lines and all the box questions. Where he says, the integrity of Muslim society is secured by the finality of profit of the and this is, of course, the doctrine that they found in the Hadi Malaya doctrine, which is now being used against enemies <coughs> in Pakistan. Um, I'm not going to debate the theology of that, because you know, it's, it's clear that there's kind of vast, um, vast discussion on the theology and how it can actually apply to enemies. Um, what is striking is that Nasi and Nasir, the member of Parliament in Pakistan, spoke about Shabbat Tatiya, Mother. She actually had to say, and I, I, I don't have the book in front of me, um, that um, no minority would, would dare question the honor of the lost prophet. Um, and, and, and in fact, that they're committed to protecting the honor. Right? So, I mean, so now even a Christian has to you know, mm -hmm. this idea of finality in Roman prophet, which is, you know, to the um, um, use of Jesus. <laughs> um, but the question I wanted to ask more was about, and, and I should say that I've argued, I have this in great depth in my own book, of this whole chapter on this issue, that um, there's something about the conceptual boundary of Pakistan at this point, which predates the, both the constitutional questions and the amendment, and which is often bound up with the question of the finality of profit, that what secures the conceptual boundary of Pakistan. In, in, in a certain imagination, is um, precisely the problem of the humanity. And, and he actually says, I mean, Paul says that, right? So when Mahudi is petitioning to have, to have um, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the genetics in place, and when they're kind of going against uh, all these more and specific entities, um, he's actually using the Paul's writings from that period. So the, the question then becomes, how much is it that the, that, that question has become central to Pakistani nationalism as a whole, not just, you know, I mean, we've got many problems, but, what, you know, how central is it to the question about Pakistan? The other thing is, we're asking America, and on the one hand, the American Constitution is great, on the other hand, perhaps a better analogy for the religious question is the racial one in America. Because it does feel to me as if, um, you know, what we have in Pakistan is a structure of lynching, which is informal, um, application of a juridical structure, right, which is that 
Could yeah. I just request to keep it short? With sure. Short. I don't know if you really talk about how great the manifestation is. So what do we mean to see the false principle in the American Constitution, where racial structures and racial practices are in fact based on juridical structures? Mm. Interesting. So we have the questions and. What, the first one was uh, which Islamic country has the right law. The second one was what are the three imperatives for better Pakistan. And uh, the third one you heard already. So, over to you. Uh, uh, so which one do you want me to tackle? Whichever you want to. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think the, the three imperatives uh, uh, that you mentioned, I mean, I'll start with that. Uh, obviously, um, I think um, the first uh, I mean, the foremost um, thing that has to be done in Pakistan is, as, as and I mentioned, is, um, as well as about education, you know, both the outreach, its access, its quality, its ideological direction, its content, its, its, its uh, uh, application of relevance to the market. So all of these things, I mean, you know, the education sector is, is vital, you know. You can't have, I mean, you can't have millions of kids out of, out of the school and you can't teach millions uh, ideological stuff and create more and more in, indoctrinated uh, people. Uh, the second one, of course, the goal of political parties is the second imperative because, I mean, if Pakistan is, is likely to remain as a, as a democracy, you know, grow as a democracy, then obviously political parties will negotiate these these interests. I mean, and interestingly, you know, the the banning, the the sort of declaration of Ahmadiyya community as non-Muslim also came through the political process. So, which means that you know, if it if it has to be reversed, it it, it has to be a political bargain or a, or, a, or a process because General Musharraf was um, personally a secular person and uh, you know he had all these intentions of, of doing good but he could not deliver anything except to create more and more jihadis for Pakistan and the world and the third imperative obviously would be uh, what Pakistan uh, critically needs uh, is uh, more uh, more jobs you know you have you, you need millions of jobs each year with the kind of population growing and the youth bulge that it's passing through uh, we know uh, if you can't keep a restive uh, young population engaged in pr productive pursuits, then you you don't uh, uh, you know uh, I mean you can't really go forward. But whether the political parties are ready to do that or not, I mean I think I, I mean I'm personally very pessimistic about it because of the fact that uh, because I've interacted with most political parties, you know, both professionally and and as a journalist. I mean, I just find that the, uh, you know, hypocrisy and two-faced uh, behavior runs uh, deep. So, you know, a, a politician would say, yes, we need to oppose this in the parliament or we, we need to bring this bill. But in the next hour, you would hear that same politician in the parliament saying, well, you know, jihad is essential and, uh, you know, or, or that we believe in the finality of prophethood or or the blasphemy in law is so important that the, the most ironic part was that when Governor Qasim was killed in January 2011 by his own guard, his political party, the Pakistan People's Party, you know, the, the last of the, of the sort of centrist, liberal, whatever forces left in Pakistan, completely backed out from supporting him. They did not even mobilize a hundred workers in support of or, or against the brutal assassination. So there was a complete debt of political mobilization. On the other hand, whenever there's something like the YouTube blasphemous video or the Danish cartoons, you see that the militant uh, networks and the jihadists are assembling thousands and thousands of people coming and burning cinemas and destroying public property and private property. So they are the street power. And all these people who privately agree that yes, we must not be intolerant, we must not be that uh, more, more bigoted, are, uh, lack that, uh, I mean, are, are, are simply afraid because now, now they're afraid that their guards may just uh, pick up the gun and say, hey, you don't believe in uh, you're a blasphemer? There you go. So, I mean, that's, that's a challenge and that's linked to the, uh, the Islamic states um, or the Muslim states uh, question that you raised. I, I mean, I think none of them is perfect, but surely, 
I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, barring the intolerant instances in, uh, you know, in, in places like Malaysia or uh, Turkey, I mean, they are they're pretty much in, in Pakistani contemporary imagination, Turkey is the place to be or the place to become because it's like the, it panders to kind of a soft Islamist image and high economic growth rate or whatever. So all, all of Pakistan's political leaders, uh, you know, love uh, talking about Mr. Erdogan and, uh, and following the Turkey model. But uh, your final comment, is there something, is there, is there a problem with the religion? You know, I mean, I, I don't have the theological uh, authority to answer that, but all I can say is from uh, my understanding of history is that Islam does need its moment of reformation. And it's, you know, there was a process, process um, uh, and, and within Islam there are, there are avenues, you know, things like ijtihad, yeah. interpretation, or ijma, through consensus, uh, re, uh, re uh, defining or, or resetting the parameters of, uh, of faith and practice and worship and public life. That can very much be done, but who will bell the cat really? Is an open if question. I may add uh, something to that, so far as the imperatives are concerned, to my mind, the imperatives and their order is slightly different. In the present day context, the imperative First imperative is the electoral reforms. Why I say that? Because by the joint, the separate electorate system for the Muslims and non-Muslims and the minorities, the society has been fragmented. So when the people contest election, they do not go to all sections of society, and society gets divided. In order to, uh, for the purpose of solidarity of the country, the representatives of the people need to go to each section of society. Now the electoral reforms are under consideration. I think that is one thing which needs to be done as a first priority. Then again, uh, what, which Islamic state is really Islamic? My answer, like Raza Rumi, is none. About Turkey also, I do not say that Turkey is an Islamic state. Turkey does not con uh, con consider it to, to be an Islamic state. It is a Muslim state, modernist Muslim state. The Turkey started with, uh, the modern day Turkey started with Kamal Atatürk, who gave it a secular color. And now they are reverting back, but those, those currents and undercurrents keep on working against one another. So, so my, my answer is no country is Islamic country. There is a reason why. Because, and this is a very crucial question, there is a long debate on that amongst the Muslim jurists. Islam is not a state. Maulana Mahdudi at one point of time said, people do not distinguish between Islam as a religion and Islam as a state. Islam is not a state. It does not provide a, a constitution or a, or, a, or a political structure. All that Islam does is claiming to be the perfect law. Islam provides the, the certain wily values. It provides political values, it provides social values, it provides certain uh, economic values. Those values can be adopted in a myriads of ways. There is no particular form of Islamic government. Present day, there is no government with Islamic. Because one value which Islam is sponsored for the government is the representative government which they call a Sura. None of these uh, states in the Middle East is an Islamic government or a, a representative government. They are the dynastical government. The dynastical rule is not an Islamic rule. Ask him any scholar, they will say that. So the, no, no, no country is an Islamic country. They may be Muslim countries of varying shades of modernization. Uh, 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 and all, all of them claim to be Muslim states. Muslim states they are because the population is Muslim. Then uh, another uh, uh, idea of whether, whether there is something wrong with religion. So this I talked of electoral reforms and now talking of religion, there is something which is happening in Southeast and Raza Rumi would know that. In Southeast now, South now there is a narrative which talks of uh, 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 politics of exclusion. Now, politics of exclusion, sometimes politics of religious exclusion, sometimes politics of ethnic exclusion. The politics of exclusion cannot be democratic. Democracy is not exclusive, it is inclusive. Democracy wants to include the minorities in the mainstream. 
Same also, the Islam is not exclusive. Islam is inclusive. One God. All creation of the same God. So therefore, human being, all one. Read the uh, uh, last sermon of the Holy <coughs> Prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, of what he said, that all humanity is one and everybody is equal and all good. So there is nothing wrong with religion. But there is everything wrong with exploiting religion for the purpose of legitimizing wrong type of rule in the name of Islam. Uh, what was the other question? Is, is, is there the question a... about the American Constitution, uh, Dr. Sadia Abbas. I, I, I did not really get the uh, question. No, no, but uh, Sadia, could you please say it again? Fine. Oh, yes, yeah, that's that, that, that question of finality. You see, the question of finality, uh, there's another question I, I would like to say about electoral reform. Because citizenship is indivisible. Citizen is a citizen, Muslim, Hindu, Christian. You can't divide Christian, uh, citizens between the different categories. That is, that is uh, unconstitutional, that is undemocratic. Now, how vital is the, how central is the question of finality of the prophethood? And when Iqbal was talking of the finality of prophethood, what was he doing? Such a broad mind, such a great philosopher, at one point of time says, declare amity that non-Muslim. Why was he doing that? In one of the American scholars and a contemporary historian, Aisha Jalal, has taken a stop of that situation. I suggest you read the uh, book of Aisha Jalal as the, uh, the, the name of the book is... Uh, uh, yes, Self and Sovereignty. So if you, if you read that book, Self and Sovereignty, you will find she has taken stock of why Iqbal was doing that. Iqbal was at that particular point of time directly under the influence of Arar. Arar was a disruptive force. I cannot take you through all that history. But Iqbal, having talked of the finality of the prophethood, if you read Iqbal's uh, six lectures, the uh, reinterpretation of Islam and all that, in that and the article which he read about, the, which he wrote about Ahmadi, you find references to German philosopher, Nietzsche and the German mysticism. And then he ultimately saying that I do not deny, but these are, these are the words of Islam, Iqbal, he said, I do not deny that the spiritual experience, that spiritual experience is possible still today, which is known as prophethood. So having talked of finality of the prophethood, he says that that experience is still possible. So this is a very complicated argument, but it, it cannot be central to the politics of Pakistan, because if finality is the central question, then what happens to Muslim, uh, non-Muslims and Christians? And finality of the prophethood is not in dispute. Ahmadis, and it is the constitution which makes it clear. Ahmadis do not dispute the finality of the prophethood. The constitutional amendment has added a clause. Does not believe in the absolute and unqualified finality. That absolute and unqualified finality is not agreed upon between all sects of Islam. Because there are people in, uh, among Muslims who still believe that there is a prophet by the name of Jesus alayhi salam, he will come back as the Messiah. So, and, the, and the concept of Shia, the Imam Mahdi, is no less than a prophet. So I think that is a controversial issue. That is not central. Its question has been made political. For Iqbal, the reason, one of the reasons Aisha Jalal has given, Iqbal was at that point of time uh, 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 meddling into the politics of Punjab. In Punjab, there was a, a disconnect between the rural Punjab and the urban Punjab. And Sir Fazl Hussain was working, uh, speaking for rural Punjab. Sir Zafullah Khan happened to be, as they say, protege of Sir Fazl Hussain. So that was, a, 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 that was the connection which prompted Iqbal, and that's a detailed discussion. If you want, we can sit sometime. Yeah, that was my question. Oh. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I would like to make just one comment. Uh, for, well, first of all, thank you, Sadia, for coming uh, here and from all the way. Uh, well, I mean, I think um, uh, I have a slightly different take. I think what Iqbal, the national poet of Pakistan, I mean, you a great uh, poet in his own right, perhaps the greatest uh, Urdu poet of the 20th century. Uh, you know, he typifies what uh, the dilemma that Pakistan <coughs> faces uh, as well, which is whether it is a territorial nation state or is it a transnational um, a fortress of Ummah. 
That split is an unresolved question. That, that, uh, this is why Pakistan's identity <coughs> to date remains uh, unresolved because, as somebody mentioned, the first line of the objective's resolution is that all sovereignty belongs to Allah, and then it says to, that the chosen representatives of the parliament will exercise. So this is contradiction uh, well, who, who really exercises authority. And Iqbal typifies that, and, and that is why you have a lot of stuff the Muslim supremacist uh, attitude, uh, the looking back to your glorious past, or oh, one thousand years of of Muslim rule and all the all the the, the, the Arab Empire, etc., and the days of glory that is also indoctrinated in Pakistani mind, because we forever think that we were once the rulers of the, and we we have to we, we we have to be supreme or better than others or other religions. And I think the third dimension uh, comes from a very so, very kind of, um, you know, which is also the, the distortion by Pakistani state and apology for jihad as a state policy too. Because Mr. Iqbal kept on uh, referring to, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, primacy of, uh, of uh, Muslim conquests, of Muslim military, uh, power, prowess, and that's and that fits into the Pakistani national security doctrines. Of course, it's not the full Iqbal; it's a it's a selective application of Iqbal. So, where so in, in in across Pakistan, in the military cantonments, in the textbooks, in the national security literature, you have Iqbal's references, like the Shaheen, the, the bird that flies high, or the or the pure woman, the, the the pure Muslim who goes and conquers the world. Uh, with, which is a, uh, a direct uh, borrowing from Nietzsche's Superman. So, uh, you know, there are all these uh, fascistic elements to it, sadly. And they have, and they have conquered the public imagination. And they, they, uh, but it's an unresolved question because at the end of the day, Pakistan is a territorial entity. It has uh, four provinces, it has some federal territories, it has people on the land, it has neighbors, it has borders. And so it has it has some interests and and so it varies between these two extremes and that's why in Pakistani mind is also split. So for for example, if something happens in Palestine or Myanmar or somewhere else, you would see these big rallies coming out on, in the big highway, you know, or some Danish man would, would draw a cartoon of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and there would be uh, uh, you know uh, fire in the country. But when it, when the own uh, you know when our own countrymen are attacked and killed, like the Shiites or the Ahmadiyyas or the Christians, there's no protest, there's no outrage. So because there's this constant split between the territory, be, be, between the lo the local and between the transnational, and that's what the constitution and the, and the Pakistani state also. Uh, signify with this ping pong uh, or seesaw of identity and unresolved questions of nationalism. Yeah, Jamaluddin Afghani called it pan Islamism, Iqbal adopted that and they uh, played with that idea for some time. Malanda Madhudi also tried to talk to pan Islamism and in that pan Islamism, Malanda Madhudi's idea of the modern day Jahiliya also dates back to the Ibn Taymiyyah philosophy. All these things are causing confusion in Pakistan. Thank you everyone. We, we are uh, over time now. I know the questions keep coming because you know, there's so much to resolve in Pakistan, but we must end uh, our program tonight. I, I would like to thank everyone once again for coming and especially the speakers uh, for speaking to us. Uh, the speakers are here, so you're most welcome to come talk to them um, afterwards. I just want to thank uh, everyone who was involved in organizing this program, uh, the co-sponsor of the James Madison program at Princeton, as well as the Center for Human Values. The South Asian group uh, also uh, participated in sponsoring this event, and uh, also the MBA Muslim Lawyer Association. So it was a joint uh, production, and I very much hope that you found the uh, discussion stimulating. As I said, you're most welcome to talk to the speakers afterwards. Thank you once again. <laughs>